Aaron McCrory is the uh, uh, Deputy Minister for Safety and Security for Transport Canada, and he joins me now. Uh, good to see you. First of Hi. all, let me say it's not often we get uh, a senior public servant who's actually working on the file, doing the heavy lifting, as I like to say, into the studio to have this conversation about government regulations and, and policy. And not that the politicians are good at it, but it's always good to have somebody that's actually working closely on the file. So let's talk about these sure. these fatigue regulation changes and so on, and, and start there with what's prompted the government to come up with new rules uh, so that pilots effectively spend less time flying and more time resting. Right. There's, Peter, there's really two fundamental reasons why we brought in these new regulations. The first is the aviation safety record. Both the U.S. Transportation Safety Board and the Canadian Transportation Safety Board have put fatigue on their watch list and have indicated this is an issue that governments need to deal with. Uh, in addition, the Transportation Safety Board has cited 34 incidents that involve fatigue in, in their accident investigations. Yeah. So that's the safety argument. The other side of it is, is, is science. Our regulations date back to 1996, and they don't reflect the latest science. And what the science tells us is when you start, matters. When you start your workday, matters. So starting at 3 o'clock in the morning is more fatiguing than starting at 8 o'clock in the morning. The amount of work you do during the day matters. Um, lots of flying, lots of takeoff and landing is more fatiguing than one, one flight. Um, when you, how takeoff much... and landing, is, you know, they're the most stressful times exactly. of the flight, right? So yeah. would, if you're doing a lot of those in a day, you're, you're up and down. You're up yeah. and down, you're working harder, you're thinking harder, so you're more fatigued. And what fatigue does is, is it impairs your judgment, it impairs your ability to act quickly. It's, 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 uh, it's, like, an, it's like impairment. Mm -hmm. And so what we know is that 12 to 14 hours without rest uh, really compromises your, your judgment and your ability to act quickly. So we wanted to update the re regulations to reflect the latest science. Let's talk about some of these changes. The maximum shift of flight duty falls from 14 hours to 13 hours, and in some cases much lower than that, I think to, to 9 hours. Yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of people, I, we, people who travel a lot, uh, we see pilots coming and going in the airport all the time. So w when you talk about those shift times, what does that mean? Is that from the moment a pilot arrives at the airport or is that time in the cockpit flying? So the flight and duty time is just that. It's the hours that they're working. So what we're doing is we're putting a limit of 9 to 13 hours of the of the work day for the pilot. But is that in the cockpit or no, from the that, time they arrive the at time the they airport arrive, the shift starts? Yeah, or, okay. the time they arrive to engines off. So they had the last flight of the day engines off. And, and the, nine, the 9 to 13 hours is based on the science. Uh, so if you're starting earlier in the day or later in the day, or if you're doing lots of different segments or flights, we want to limit you to nine hours. If you're doing, if you're starting mid-morning and you've got one flight, then you can do the 13 hours. Sure. Um, and what's changing about time off? We're, what we're doing is making sure we're guarding the time that, that pilots have, uh, their rest periods, to make sure they have adequate time for rest. What we know is that human body needs six to eight hours of sleep. To get six to eight hours of sleep, you need that much time in bed and a certain amount of time away from work. So uh, depending on the circumstances, we're making sure that all pilots have at least 10 or 12 hours free from work to get the rest they need to be uh, efficient the next day. Okay, and there are special provisions, uh, as I read through it here, for, for instance, for emergency flying, uh, you know, fighting fires, uh, transport patients. Uh, tell me about that. Uh, th those are more relaxed rules or? Well, what we've done is, is we've looked at, there's, there's two circumstances here, is, is for medevac and given there's, there's a, a, a transporting people for medical emergencies, uh, we heard a lot from stakeholders, especially in the north, uh, that the, the limits of 9 to 13 hours might compromise their ability to provide effective medevac services to the communities they serve. So we paid attention to that and they will continue to comply with the rules that are in place today. The same goes for what we call in a kind of a technical term, aerial works, the firefighting operations, aerial survey, aerial photography, they're going to continue to uh, comply with the existing regulations in large part because they don't have fair paying passengers in their aircraft. So we want to make sure that passengers are protected. Airlines will be able to get around um, some of the rules if they can convince you and your colleagues at Transport Canada that they have a fatigue risk management system. Right. Um, first of all, what is that and what do they have to convince you of to be able to stretch these hours, change these hours? So I don't want to be argumentative, but it's not get around the rules. Okay. It's another way of complying with the rules. And, and what they have to do is they come to the department, they tell us they'd like to take advantage of this option, this flexibility that we put into the rules, tell us how they're going to do it, and if they meet our regulatory requirement, we'll give them a tentative approval. We're going to approve their plan to do this uh, based on the regula like regulations that are in place. That gives them a period of time to put in place measures to stretch the limits a little bit but mitigate the effects of that. So for example, if you've got a route that goes from, uh, I grew up in Regina, from Regina to Edmonton, and you're hauling uh, cargo, uh, and it normally takes you 14, 15 hours, you wouldn't be allowed to do that today. 
But if you provided rest in the middle of that flight, if you allowed the, 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 the crew to rest in Edmonton before the return flight to, uh, to Regina and broke up that flight, then we'd allow them to have a 15-hour duty day because we know in the middle of it, the airline is providing two or three hours of rest where they can recuperate and get ready to fly again. Uh, they need to gather data. They need to give us evidence that the, the, ch the, the changes they've made under the fatigue risk management system are ensuring that their flight crews remain alert and they're not fatigued. And we'll use that evidence, A, to approve their fatigue risk management system, and then to check on them on a periodic basis as they implement it. Okay. Um, presumably, uh, shorter hours for pilots uh, working through the, the system here probably means more pilots, probably means more costs uh, for the airlines. What does it mean to the passenger? So we've, you know, as, as we have to for any regulatory package, we look to take a cl close look at what the costs are. And our estimate is, in worst case scenario, if the pa costs are passed on to passengers, you're looking at it probably about a 29 cent per passenger uh, uh, increase in the cost of a ticket, plus the huge increase in terms of the level of safety. Okay, let's finish, just finish on the timelines here. When will these changes be implemented in place? So a lot of the feedback we got from industry spoke to the need for them, and I think it was quite legitimate on their part to highlight. It takes time to implement, especially from a scheduling point of view, updating their software, their scheduling software and their, uh, that they use to, to schedule their pilots. So we're giving the largest air carriers in the country, the West Jets, the Air Canada's mm -hmm. of the world, we're giving them two years to implement these new regulations. Smaller air carriers, less sophisticated, just to say, but less sophisticated, we're giving them four years because uh, they just need that little bit extra time to be able to uh, adjust to the new reality. All right, changes coming in uh, the way pilots uh, will be uh, dealing with flight and, and rest and duty times. Uh, Aaron McCrory from Transport Canada, thanks for your time. It was my pleasure.